This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. NBC News space correspondent and author Jay Barbary on this edition of Conversations. For over half a century, Jay Barbary has been on the front line of the United States space program. From Neil Armstrong's first steps on the moon to the space shuttle Challenger tragedy, the Emmy award-winning Barbary has covered the highs and lows of manned space travel. As a journalist, his insight and reporting has given viewers and readers a keen understanding of America's space pursuits. Apart from his 50 plus years with NBC News, Barbary has authored or co-authored numerous books, including his collaboration with Alan Shepard, Deke Slayton, and Neil Armstrong on the New York Times bestseller, Moonshot. Barbary's latest book is a deep dive into the life of the first man to walk on the moon. Neil Armstrong, A Life of Flight, provides an incredible look at one of America's true heroes. We are pleased to welcome Jay Barbary to this edition of Conversations. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Jeff. How did the book come about? Well, we talked about it, We, Neil Armstrong and myself, we talked about it since he worked with me on uh, Moonshot back in 1994. Actually, we started talking about doing a book on him in 1992, but I could never bring him to a computer or a typewriter because he simply didn't like to talk about himself. Mm -hmm. He wanted to talk about everybody else, and as soon as you start trying to talk to him about Neil Armstrong, he'd vector the conversation off to Jim Lovell or John Glenn or the one of the others. So I never quite was able to bring him and sit him down to do it. But just before he died, he told me to go ahead because we had written a lot of stuff together. I wrote about him in five different books. And so we pretty well had everything nailed down. And I'd interviewed him so much about how he felt when he was stepping onto the moon. And he told me some things and we chuckle about a few things. And one of the biggest things that he was always asked so many questions about Jeff was the footprint, the first footprint on the moon. Well, Neil was so concerned about checking his lunar module out, the Eagle, right. that he walked around, was checking the module out as soon as he got out there and made sure everything was all right to take off again. So he looked down to take a picture of the first step on the moon, and all he had looks like a bunch of chicken scratching back there. <laughs> He'd walked all over the first, and he was mad at himself for a few minutes on that. But uh, that, that gives you some idea. But uh, anyway, we went ahead and did it. And uh, one of the main reasons, the engine that was driving the book was John Glenn, Jim Lovell, Tom Stafford, who commanded Apollo 10. We were sitting around talking a couple of weeks after Neil's death and, and someone com uh, commented that about, we were all in our 80s now, and John Glenn says, yeah, I'll be 93 on July the 18th. So we said, if we don't get this book done on Neil, it's not gonna get done. So we really need to get it done because we're all in, uh, God's waiting room, and somebody else said, yeah, this is the oldest magazine you've ever seen is here in God's <laughs> waiting room. But anyway, we got to get this done. So that was a driving engine behind it. So I spent 21 months, and we got it out this summer. Neil was quite reserved, and he certainly was not a person that, that, that tried to bring publicity to himself. But the two of you had a pretty close relationship, as I understand it. How did that relationship develop? Well, I like to say, yeah, it was close, but it was a trusted relationship. And it evolved out of the fact, excuse me, uh, he lost a young daughter at the age of two to a brain tumor. And we lost a young son, my wife and I did, to Highland Brim brain disease. And the morning after that, I was in Howard Johnson's on Cocoa Beach and walked in and uh, uh, Wally Shara was sitting there. And I sat down with Wally and he said, uh, you look a little down this morning. So I told him what had happened. And then Neil came in just as Wally was leaving. So he sat down with us and he looked at me and he says, who shot your dog? And so I told him what happened and we got to talking. Well, a lot of people didn't even know he had a daughter, mm -hmm. let alone had lost a daughter because he never talked much about anything. He started telling me about Karen Ann's death. And so we got to talking. Both of us small town boys. I'm from a town only 5,000 population. He's from a town only 6,000. John Glenn was the same way. We were small town boys and we liked kind of to stick together and, with, and, and, and kept pretty much to ourselves and enjoyed the, the solitude that a lot of people feel like, you know, they gotta be doing something all the time. And so we just grew into that. But I, one thing I, um, 
as a journalist, I've always tried to get two solid sources on everything. And Neil was a great source that I was developing. But I made sure that the way he was, that I never put anything on the air that he didn't say okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't have to, as you know, as a journalist, if you ask a person a question, they give you the answer. Right. By every right, you have a right to use it. Right. And uh, unless they say it's off the record, then you don't have a right to use it. So, but I would ask him anyway. <clears throat> and we talked about a lot of things. I told him a lot, I got a lot of information for him on different things that he was working on, like in the Challenger accident, he was vice chairman you know, on that committee for President Reagan and inviting what to cause the Challenger accident. And we worked like that for over a half century. And I not never really knowingly broken a trust or confidence with Neil. Now, there are things that he told me in confidence that I wouldn't break in this book. Mm -hmm. And people told me, well, he's passed on. It's okay now. I said, no, it's not. It's not okay because he told me in confidence and it's going to stay that way. And uh, so anyway, we had that type of relationship and I like to say a trusted friendship because somebody said that Jay Barbary is Neil Armstrong's best friend. Well, that's bunk. I don't even know who Neil Armstrong's best friend was. <laughs> but we were trusted friends and he had other trusted friends and uh, that was the type of relationship between us and another a uh, person asked his family, I, when, as soon as we decided to go ahead with a book, I told his family, I told them, I said, uh, <clears throat> any of you would like to be part of this, the sons or his wife, Carol. Carol said, this book takes place before he and I were together, and Rick and uh, Mark said, no, we, we okay, I understood it. And in fact, frankly, to be totally honest with you, I was glad because the worst thing you can do as a writer, as an author, is have to work with the family mm -hmm. because it is next to impossible to please them. Right. They know they have a certain feel for who a person is and right. they try to get everything. Well, he wouldn't have tied his shoes that way, you know. Right, so right, right. I don't like to write biographies for that reason. I won't write biographies for that reason. So we have a wonderful relationship. And some guy said the other day, and the AP reviewer wrote about it, he says, Barbary didn't have approval of the family. And so the AP guy says, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, as a journalist, you don't have to have approval of anybody. Right. Nobody can censor you, not under our constitution. But Neil and I, you know, wrote for 50 years. I've already written about him in five, uh, five books, and now all of a sudden I got to get permission to write this book? Uh, you know, no, that do it doesn't work that way. What kind of man was he? Neil Armstrong would probably had more character than most men I know. Because as you know, Jeff, most men, if they'd have been first to step on the moon, they could have come back, owned a thousand moon burger joints, been richer than Trump, but Neil wasn't interested in that. He wasn't interested in ingratiating himself or enriching himself from his experience. He wanted his family to have what they needed. He wanted them to be comfortable. You know, he wanted everybody to enjoy life. But beyond that, he wasn't interested in that. He was interested in pushing the envelope of science because he was a scientist before he was a pilot and, uh, and a research test pilot. And I think he did a lot to do that because he, he always told me, he says, Jay, he says, you can prepare for what's expected. You can go over it, you can keep preparing, you can nail it down. What you can't prepare for is the unexpected. And this is what he was very adept at, of getting out of tight situations. And he had it happen to him several times. And this is what the people at NASA noticed about him and why he was so good and so calm. Because, uh, you know, as a boy, he'd had dreams that he was flying. And, and for some reason, he felt, okay, as long as I hold my breath, I'm not going to fall. <laughs> and it didn't matter how high he was, but he, and, and I'm the same way. Now, I'm a pilot, but I'm not a 
I'm not a pilot, and I'm not a pilot like you. Well, you, <laughs> you know, you have your own jet. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I, no, no, not no. quite. So you don't have your own jet. You just fly a jet. Is that right? Okay. And, uh, why were you trying to sell me a jet if you don't own your own jet? Why is this, Jeff? What is this? It's, it's, it's a little old jet, little old lady on the floor. Right, you're trying to sell me her jet, right? Well, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, I forgot the whole. I forgot about what I was saying there, but. You know, this man pinned everything down and he concentrated on everything and he was all for us getting back to exploring space because we haven't really explored space with astronauts since Apollo 17 in mm -hmm. December 1972. It's mm -hmm. been, what, 42 years since mm -hmm. we had somebody be on Earth orbit? Mm -hmm. And we've just stopped there. And what most people don't realize, had we not gone to the moon, and had to develop the science as quickly as we did, the digital computer and all that, there's more in your iPhone today. Mm -hmm. You have more computation than you, they did on Eagle right. capacity. And we would be 50 years, scientists tell me, behind where we are had we not gone to the moon. And everybody starts talking about, well, how much should it cost? Then we cost it, forget it. Right. You know, it cost 25 billion bucks. In days money, probably, probably 125 billion, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, what all we got out of driving the envelope, and the only reason we went was for national prestige, you know, to beat the Russians. Right. Now, we need to get back, and this is what Neil thought. He says uh, he liked to talk about the threes. We should, first, we should nail down space flight within three seconds of talking to mission control, because take Mars, for example. The average time to communicate between Earth and Mars is nine minutes. So if you're landing on Mars and say, wait a minute, Houston, they're not going to hear that for nine <laughs> minutes. So they ain't going to help you very that's much, right, right? That's right, that's right. So, so anyway, he said, we nail this down. We get three seconds, and then we'd be three days away from coming home, not six months away. Right, right. See? So what were the other two things that he... Well, well, the other two things are the threes was uh, what I was saying was distance and, 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 and exploring. And he wanted to nail this down. He wanted to nail it down as far as uh, the moon was concerned. He felt like we should build a colony at the Attican Basin, which is uh, you can set the United States inside of Attican Basin. Plenty of water there, we found out. Also, the temperatures would be right. And then going out to the Lagrangian points, going out to the asteroids and all this stuff because the basic idea is that Earth is only a spacecraft itself. It's 8,000 miles in diameter. We're all astronauts. Mm -hmm. It's finite. The human race has been here less than 200,000 years. Any time now we could have a, a disease like threatening in Africa mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the human race couldn't deal with. Mm -hmm. So we don't have somewhere else to go. You know, we're going to be extinct. And probably that's what's going to happen. Where are we in the United States today as far as getting back into space or getting back to the moon or getting to Mars? A lot of talk about it. They've got, the, they've got the heavy lift vehicle. They've had that. They could have continued with it. But they've gone off on this politics to spending money on these little things and that thing and all. And it is to keep Congress and Senate happy. <clears throat> and they're trying to keep their budget going. People say today, well, we don't have the money. Yeah, we do. NASA's budget is 16 to $17 billion a year. What we need to do is cut out this nonsense that we're spending the money on, mm -hmm. okay? We've got, NASA has two missions a year to put astronauts on the space station and take them off currently now. We don't have a rocket that could put a flea on the space station live. So we've got to develop, we're developing the Orion spacecraft, they're finally getting around to it. We can't do it, the Russians are threatening to throw us off the space station. Uh, after 2021, we've got to get back with our own vehicle. John Glenn got on his knees in front of Barack Obama as a Democrat senator from Ohio. He begged him not to cancel the last shuttle. Let's at least keep one spacecraft in case of emergencies, in case, in case we lose relationships with Russia. Mm -hmm. As what John Glenn and Alan Shepard and those guys went through in the race with the Russians to get to the moon, now to be totally dependent on Russia to get our astronauts to the space station? That didn't sit right. It didn't mm. sit right with uh, Neil or any of the astronauts, really.
So we need to get back to that, but more importantly, we need to start exploring again, building the stockpile of knowledge. Take me back through your career. <clears throat> You, you, what was it like, uh, and, and two, two milestones I want to ask you about, what was it like as you covered Neil Armstrong walking on the moon, and also what was it like the day that the Challenger exploded? Well, in the early days, like when we lost the Apollo 1 crew in the Apollo 1 fire, now Gus was a friend, mm -hmm. Neil was a friend, Ed White was a friend, not as good as Gus and Neil. Of course, Neil and Ed were neighbors, they were next door neighbors, you know, <clears throat> in Houston. But you felt it more as a personal loss. But as Neil was the first one to tell you, the good out of that tragedy was we learned what a sloppy spacecraft was being put together and they got everything corrected before we went to the moon. He said, had we had that happen, we would have, had we not done that, we would have probably lost a couple of crews out there we didn't lose. So we got to the moon on the backs of Gus, Ed, and Roger. And uh, everybody feels that way with it. Now, Neil, you always thought about uh, them getting into a close call. When Neil had to make the first emergency return from space on Gemini 8, right after he performed the first docking in space on Gemini 8, uh, and they were over China and they had to get back, oh, I sweated. You know, because we were not yet friends like we were when he died because but I that that was 1966 and I began to really get to know him in 1964 and knew him from 1962 when he came in with Gemini 9. I also knew who he was because I'd gone out and covered a couple of X-15 flights that he flew uh, but getting to know him and uh, being the quiet guy that he was and uh, so you, you thought about these people and, and like Challenger standing under Challenger when that blew up. When I saw it blow, I knew exactly what it was and because I'd seen so many fail in the past, but we weren't on the air. Only mm -hmm. CNN was on the mm -hmm. air live. And I had this overwhelming feeling that something tragic was about to happen. So I picked up the phone, called and the phone was actually ringing the desk in New York when it exploded. And I told Jim on the other end, I said, uh, we just had a uh, tragic accident here. And he said, what, the shuttle? And I said, yeah, look at your monitor. They weren't looking that close, see? And they were just, it was, it was happening, but we didn't hang up that line. We got on the air and we started going. We had several hundred people come in and NBC decided that they were gonna put my efforts forward in breaking the story because I had the contacts at the Cape to do that, mm. you know. So we, we went to work on that. But we always had this, but again, it was always knowing that they were professionals, mm. that this was something they chose to do. And, and you know, you were concerned about them. I was probably more concerned about John Glenn than anybody because they had so much trouble with that atlas and finally, uh, T.J. O'Malley, God bless his heart, he came down and came back, uh, you know, and came over to that actually and started, uh, you know, kicking some rumps and getting some stuff taken care of and got that ready to fly John Glenn in orbit. Mm. And then they had, that, then afterwards, the guy they called on to come back and get, get everything in shape was O'Malley, the same guy that did John Glenn. He came back and got Apollo in shape, you see. But, yeah, it, well, you knew everybody. It was a thing. What was it like the day Neil Armstrong walked on the moon from a, from a journalist standpoint? Well, it wasn't like the greatest story ever because we had led up to that. We had done so much like Apollo 10, Snoopy had gone down to 8.4 miles for the moon. So you were taking a bite at a time in it. So this was the next evolution, the next step. But after they were sitting on the moon, then it hits you and you realize that what had been accomplished mm -hmm. and how momentous it was. Yeah, and yeah uh, it was, the whole thing was, but again, you were living it and it yeah. was all part of it and it was the next step. Uh, and, and, and there were a lot of um, firsts like that where you really took a pause and realized what had happened. One of the things that I took away from your book was just how sophisticated the technology was for those days and how smart the guys and girls who were working on 
the space program were. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible because, as you mentioned earlier, today your iPhone has more computing power. But what they were able to accomplish is just, when you go back and read it and think, it's incredible. Well, you see, the mindset in those days, people would come to work, they didn't worry about when the quitting time came. Most of them would work way late into the evening if they needed to because they felt very responsible. It was national prestige for the company, I mean for the country. country yeah. <clears throat> so we wanted to get to the moon first. And everybody worked so hard and they were so dedicated to the safety of the astronauts to get it done. That's why when what happened when Apollo 1 fire, you know, people were so so upset about it because they had worked so hard but we had these new people all of a sudden that came in and were trying to catch up and trying to learn instead of going with the experienced people. Again, this is where politics raised its ugly head mm -hmm. because uh, LBJ, nobody was a bigger supporter than Lyndon Baines Johnson of the space program, but uh, you had California, the big Democrat state, uh, you know, coming along at the time and so uh, he was thinking about his 68 election, so he wanted to do something for California, so uh, North American got it, got the contract instead of St. Louis, you know, McDonald. And the experience was at McDonald's in St. Louis. They had built the Mercury and the Gemini. It was McDonald Douglas. You McDonald Douglas. Know, right. Well, it was that time, it was just McDonald. Just, just McDonald. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah, great. So anyway, this is the problem that you always run into. You run into the politics. It's what's here. We got sixteen to eight, seventeen billion dollars a year for NASA, and so much is spent on so much waste. And for yeah. example, we got so many space centers across the country. Like the reason for Houston was the biggest laugh that ever came along. You see, because there was absolutely no reason to put mission control out there. In fact. <laughs> In fact, uh, Johnson was appointed as vice president, was appointed uh, head of the Space Council, so he tells, t tells Texas and his Libya oil partners out there, I'm going to bring mission control out here. Well, Bob Gilruth was brought down from Langley, and he was a sailor, and he liked sailing on the Chesapeake Bay, and so he didn't want to leave up there, so they had to do it with the 28th inclination to the equator, so because we launched to the east and you're already, the pad is already moving at 800 plus miles per hour, so you got to reach 17.3 or 17.5 miles per hour, 1,000, 17,000, oh, you know, right, right. to get into Earth orbit. <clears throat> and you already got 800 miles working for you when you go up. You go the opposite direction, that's almost 2,000 more you got to grab going out. So. Anyway, we we're going to launch on the 28 degree inclination. And they said, we got to have it at 28 degrees. And the reason was, and it was the biggest laugh ever, was radio interference. Well, every RF engineer laughed their head off. What the hell are you talking about, radio <laughs> interference? Well, the too many missile launches on you. So we got to be at least, says LBJ, says the Space Committee, says we got to be at least 120 miles away. That's what the engineers say. So we got to get 120 miles away from the Cape to put that. <laughs> well, at that time, they closed McNeil Air Force Base at Tampa. Here's this big, shiny sack base with the longest runways available. They need a deep water port. What deeper water port than Tampa Bay? And so the Florida delegation goes up and say, we got it. This is the place for the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, for the uh, mission, control. Uh, mission control, and it's more than 120 miles away. It's 160 miles, 165 miles away. This is it. Well, LBJ sent them back in again. Now they come out and they restudy it. Now they got to be 175 miles or 180 <laughs> miles away, and that puts them out here in the Gulf of Mexico. See? So he's out there sitting this thing up with this cow pasture out south of uh, Houston owned by Giddy Oil. And so he's got his oil partners out there, and they were sitting, there was two cows in that whole pasture where that thing was built. They got them out there, okay. But now Gilruth is still looking for his deep water port. So he goes out in Mare Island, which is just north of San Diego. Beautiful, beautiful sailing out there, perfect place for mission control. So the director of the Manned Spacecraft Center says, well, we're gonna to go to Mare Island, we're gonna to go to San Diego, it'll be beautiful, that's where it's gonna be. 
Johnson says, come here, says, get into my office. <laughs> so he brought him in, he says, don't you get it yet? He says, mission control is going south of Houston. <laughs> We've got the land that Giddy Oil is going to give it to Rice University and we're going to build it there. And Gilru says, but the closest deep water port is Gaveston Bay. And according to the rules, it's not close enough. It's too far to transfer big equipment over right. land. Right. We need a deep water port to bring these things into. So anyway, it's all, we got we got Clear Lake. Well, Clear Lake you, is about knee deep <laughs> all across. In fact, Alan Shepard and Deke Slayton and all of them out there, all fishing at Clear Lake, talking about, boy, we love our deep water port. <laughs> you know, they're walking across there. Well, it, and so they go to Rice University. They say to Rice University, they said, now we'll, if you'll if you'll give this back, you know, said to us, said, we'll give you this land and you can make it to Rice University. And Rice says, okay, I'll go along with the scheme, but you got to build it like a college campus so we can use it after the program is over with. Politics. Right. I'm almost out of time. I've got about a minute. What do you want the reader to take away from this book? I want them to know Neil Armstrong. I want them to know what kind of man he was and what kind of character that the man had and what he did for the stockpile of knowledge for the, this planet that we're living on. What a great man he was. I am so happy that he was the man, the first man to step on a place other than Earth. He never took advantage of it. He never thought of himself as being anything special, but everybody else around him did. Mm. I wanted that book selfishly to be in the libraries for future generations to read. And that's why we tried so hard and to put everything together where it would be an interesting read and they would know Neil when they got through reading it in his life of flight. It is not his biography. This is his life of flight, his legacy of flight. I think you accomplished it. I think Thank it's well you, done. God bless you. Thank God you. bless you, Jay. Great job. I, the thing I was thinking of as I was reading this book is, is what a great asset it would be um, in the classroom because I remember studying this coming up as a, as a young elementary student. I thought, you did a great job with it and you were there. And that, Thank you, sir. That's, that's what's good. Best of luck to you. Jay Barbary, space correspondent for NBC News and the author of Neil Armstrong, Life of Flight. By the way, you can see some more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations, also on YouTube and Facebook. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself. We'll see yeah, you soon. We can see you coming down the ladder now. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. The lamb footbeds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches. I'm going to step off the lamb now. That's one small step for man. One I am late for me and I Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.